um, just wanted to let you know that MLS is back because the MLS is back tournament is over. So once the tournament ends, MLS comes back. So that means MLS is back after MLS is back. And if you missed any of the MLS is back tournament, you actually missed some downright enjoyable soccer. It seems a lot of you missed the MLS is back tournament. Last week's final between Portland and Orlando had less than half a million viewers and the tournament averaged about a quarter of a million viewers per game. Those are some tough numbers, pal. <laughs> For context, the NWSL Challenge Cup final in Utah drew 650,000 viewers and most of their tournament was behind a paywall with CBS All Access and had zero advertising. But I don't blame you for not watching the MLS is back tournament. Honestly, I blame the crazy schedule. Many of the opening games were postponed or downright canceled due to COVID related issues. At the beginning of the tournament, because of Dallas and Nashville, many of the games were postponed and downright canceled. And when things did get going, the games were at crazy hours. I'll tell you who didn't miss the tournament though, Greg Burhalter, men's national team coach. He hung out in the bubble, lurked for a few nights, watched some great national team prospects step out, and even got to see his 19-year-old son's professional debut for Columbus Crew. But many of you not only watched the tournament, but you participated in my MLS is Back Between Clean Sheets Tournament Bracket Challenge. And guys, I just gotta say, we were so wrong. Diehards to casual fans, everyone was way off base. I had over 40 submissions for this bracket, and I've got to say, it seems we collectively had much higher hopes for Atlanta United than we should have. Same goes for Seattle, Sporting Kansas City. We definitely didn't think Orlando would make it to even a semifinal, but we were right about a few things. Philadelphia had a solid showing, LA Galaxy definitely did not, and Orlando, Florida still sucks in the summer. Also, no one had Orlando City in the final. Congrats to them for making it that far. Personally, I predicted a rematch at the 2015 MLS Cup between Portland and Columbus, but the rest of my bracket was terrible and I don't want to show it to you because the road to the cup was really rocky. I probably should have waited to send the bracket out until after the group stage, but you guys, it was my first time. I was just super excited. Next time I'll try not to make you do so much guesswork and you can worry about the matchups and not the format. I calculated the score kind of like a March Madness bracket. And before I announce the winner, I want to give honorable mentions to the only two people who accurately predicted that Portland would make it to the final. That's my buddy Rocky, fantasy league mate and friend from Portland who's a huge Timbers fan, and also Christian Putales, host of the Quattro Quattro Dos podcast and Houston Dynamo fan. Brackets were all over the place, but from the knockout stage onward, Justin Totten had it most consistently predicted. Justin, if you have made it to this part of the video, congratulations, this moment of silence is for you, buddy. Justin, I will be sliding into your DMs to get the right size for your pick of an MLS jersey. And guys, if giveaways, brackets, competitions, etc., are at all interesting to you, leave a comment below and give me some ideas. I really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know you guys through this bracket challenge and looking for more ways to connect with you. I hope you enjoy the tournament as much as I did. If you got a chance to watch, you'll agree that many of those games were worth staying up until midnight for. The next phase of MLS, because MLS is back, is already underway. Both Nashville and Dallas have already met in Texas twice to make up for all the soccer they didn't play in July. Across the league, the next three weeks will feel like an all-out sprint. Teams play conference games at home and on the road, but they stick to their respective region. For example, DC United will play all teams in the Northeast, and the farthest they travel beyond that is Cincinnati, who they play on Friday. A majority of these matches will be played without fans, which I think is the smartest and safest option at the moment. And since the border is closed, Canada will be playing itself. There are three teams in Canada, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto. They will be playing each other three times. Three times three, nine. There will be nine strictly Canadian games. This is supposedly the first of three phases as MLS returns to normalcy, but arrangements have already been made for the postseason. Playoffs expand. There will be 18 teams instead of 14, and playoffs will begin on November 20th. The cup is scheduled on December 12th. Oh, and by the way, the US Open Cup is canceled. Sorry. And now without further ado, my first interview with a professional soccer player. I didn't know you were from uh, Southern California. Yeah, I grew up in San Diego um, <laughs> mostly, and I don't tell people this unless uh, they're from Southern California, but I also briefly lived in Palmdale. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm in Palmdale. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Cheyenne with Between Clean Sheets, and I am having my very first player interview, a very, very casual chat 
with DC United's Steve Birnbaum. We actually have a lot more in common than he realizes. And before we hit record, I told him uh, how our journeys have been quite similar, both in DC and being Southern California natives. So the conversation we're having today is gonna start with a few of those similarities and Steve being a Southern Californian from Vermont. Yeah. Perfect. Right. I did wanna ask you, cause I know you have um, a very different experience growing up playing sports than I think a lot of the guys we know who have gone through the academy program or the younger teens and guys in their early 20s on the team right now are experiencing. So you did grow up playing a handful of sports and I'm wondering what the value was in casting kind of a wide net athletically as opposed yeah. to like picking one sport and going with it. Yeah, I think um, for me, my whole life, I've just kind of been a sports junkie. Um, I love every sport um, and I really took to it as a young age, just not just soccer, but sports in general. And I actually probably played um, as a kid more baseball than, than soccer growing up, um, which is so different than, you know, what all the kids are doing right now and even guys right. on our team. Uh, you know, I played baseball a ton and then, um, you know, I played basketball, I uh, played volleyball, played lacrosse. I played volleyball and lacrosse in high school as well. Um, but, uh, you know, and when I was a kid in Southern California, as you know, you kind of have to ch choose a sport when you get to high school um, because it's like year round, you know, you can play sports year round there. So it was, I had to choose between baseball and soccer. And uh, because you could run around the whole time and, you know, play both sides of the ball, I chose soccer. Um, and that was kind of how it started. And um, I really took to it after that and kind of put all my energy into soccer, uh, I would say going into like freshman year of high school. It's weird you say that because, again, that's another um, commonality or something that we share. I think especially because I had played golf in high school, when you are that young thinking about what sport to play, your brain is just telling you do the thing that's most exciting right. and most adrenaline inducing and soccer would definitely win between that and baseball for sure. That was exactly it. And um, for me, I, I think uh, I think times are different now, but um, I think I had the benefit of not getting burnt out with soccer. Um, you know, I didn't, I trained maybe twice a week, Tuesday, Thursday nights um, after school. And then, you know, had a bunch of games on the weekend, but that was really it. Now kids are training every day um, and they got games on the weekend and, you know, it's a full-time job as a kid. And I don't know if um, I really would have stuck with it that much um, if I had to do, you know, an academy and um, really commit my entire, you know, life to soccer at a really young age. So um, I'm really happy the way um, that I progressed and I was able to go to college and I really think that was a good step for me. Um, I grew up a lot as a person and um, as a player too. So um, I was fairly mature when I came in the league at 23, a lot different from these kids. <laughs> yeah, that was actually one of my questions is kind of which would you choose the, the academy route that I think seems so popular for kids these days or to go um, high school to college to pro and I you answered it beautifully but I wonder for um, you have one beautiful daughter correct and then yeah. another one on the way soon are you as a parent I know you'll probably be grateful if they pick sports at all but are you more inclined to guide them toward one or two sports or hobbies or let them cast that wide net as well I think I'm going to let them cast that net. Um, you know, everyone's different. And um, my wife's a super creative, artsy, um, you know, woman. And so she's, you know, maybe one of, you know, either our daughter or our son will take that direction or whatever it may be. I'm, I'm just happy to let them be themselves and I'll guide them in the best direction I can. But um, when talking about um, academy and deciding whether to go to college or not, um, my preference is to always go to college, I think, for for me personally, and I talked to a lot of the younger guys about this was, um, you know, I got into Berkeley, a very prominent, you know, academic school, and I would have probably not gotten into there uh, if it wasn't for soccer. And so at least I say, if you're able to get into one of these very high level academic schools, um, at least for a year, you can always turn pro after that. And um, they'll allow you back into that school after that year. So um I think that is almost the best way to go um, just because then you always have that door open where you can go back to school and go to a school that you weren't maybe going to get into um, if you didn't have the grades for. So that's kind of my take on it. But um, college soccer is going a different direction. It's a lot different than what it was, um, you know, 10 years ago. Right. Right. I agree. Um, 
Now, we are going to move on to your time at Cal, and I realized your former uh, coach at Berkeley, Kevin Grimes, is still there, by the way. Yeah. Um, that guy's like a Berkeley lifer, I've noticed. But in looking at his professional career, I noticed he played for the Colorado Foxes, mm -hmm. Miami Freedom, the Los Angeles Salsa, which is my personal favorite, yeah. Raleigh Flyers, San Jose Clash, which we know, and then Orange County Zodiac. Yeah. Um, soccer to me is like the only league that's growing right now. So we've, of course, in the past few years, just in MLS have Atlanta United, Minnesota United, LA Football Club, Charlotte Football Club. And yeah. then last week they announced St. Louis's new team. I'm wondering, would Steve Birnbaum go the route of the formal like football club, soccer club, United route? Or would you be naming them some of these kooky, kooky team names? I think I'm more... Um... American than most uh, in choosing names. So I, you know, I would go the, the old school route of, you know, like the LA salsa or whatever it was, but um, just because that's, you know, everything kind of sounds the same now. So um, I like the, you know, you have the Los Angeles Lakers or the LA Rams or whatever, you know, there's, it's just now it's all United or, you know, FC or SC or, you know, just the city. So it's fun to be a little bit more creative in that sense. Um, I guess we're taking after the the European model, but um, for me, yeah, I kind yeah. of like the American way of creating a, a brand. In my mind, I feel like we could take after the European model in so many other ways, but we could like keep the names American. Yeah, yeah I agree. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, and yeah, LA Salsa, I was just thinking, and back to baseball, minor league baseball teams have the best names. Best names, mascots. that's for sure, yeah. Um, I, in my mind, I think if we could just get USL to pick that up and then have it kind of like trickle upward yeah. that we're not dealing with my personal least favorite of these last, um, few announcements yeah. is the Charlotte FC. <laughs> yeah. um, I won't make you have an opinion on that, but I personally, no, don't. it's okay. Um, and back to your time at Berkeley. So I also went through your roster for your time there. Um, I think your first year was 2009. Uh, and you've played with a handful of guys who are still in MLS or like MLS adjacent. David Bingham, who plays for Galaxy, uh, Servando Carrasco, who played in California for a while and is now in USL, and then Nick Lima, who I believe you guys overlapped by one year, but who plays yeah. for the San Jose Earthquakes. Yeah. I'm assuming uh, your mom and your family have expressed interest for you to stay West Coast at some point like those guys have. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it was always, a, I, it was, it's weird because when I was a kid, I was a galaxy fan growing up, um, right. you know, not far from there. I was 30 minutes from there. I was a ball boy, um, occasionally. And oh, no uh, way. yeah, I loved watching, uh, going to galaxy games. And it was a fun atmosphere. So naturally that was kind of, you know, where I wanted to end up. Um, but you know, I found a great home here. Um, you know, I met my wife out here, um, maybe four or five years ago and, you know, we're creating our family out here and we have a great group of friends and uh, this is kind of where we call home now and um, it's great to go visit my family back in California and who knows what the future holds but you know as of now we're we're enjoying our time and on the east coast and I consider myself an east coaster now um, I still am not used to the the weather change I think right. the, yeah. the summer still hits me in the face um, every year but uh, you know I'm, I'm getting there. Yeah, speaking of summer weather hitting you in the face, I mean, was that the most annoying part of being in the bubble? Was the was the weather and the late game schedule because of it? Um, I think it was. That was obviously a factor. I think you saw that in our first game against uh, Toronto and how slow the game was because it was a morning game and it was really hot and humid. Um, but the the toughest thing is being away from your family and not being home for that long. I think that's the biggest thing for for all of the guys was was being mm -hmm. away and. Um, having all this downtime and, you know, not being able to see your family. So that was, that was the most frustrating thing, but obviously the humidity takes it out of you. So, you know, we'd have trainings or games and you'd just be, you know, tapped out after that. So um, yeah, I mean, it, or the Orlando humidity and heat is, is different level down there. Right. So when you're planning like a family vacation to Disney <laughs> World. It will not be Florida. <laughs> we'll go to, we'll go to You'll Disneyland. You'll definitely do Disneyland. Okay. Smart. Yeah. Smart idea. Okay. Back to Berkeley though. Um, with your coach, Kevin Grimes, being there so long um, and 
I think that being like your first step into what has become your professional career, yeah. was there some sort of like Grimes philosophy or golden bear mentality that really helped you out when you first started in major league soccer? Yeah. Um, Kevin, he runs a great program up there and it's very um, professional. I mean, the facilities there that he has, the, the way just the grass is cut, he's very detail oriented. And that was always, um, you know, um, a topic about what he would, you know, push on us was um, to be detail oriented in our, our preparation. And that was the biggest thing for me is he, he said, if you prepared great throughout the week, you know, you were in a good position to perform on the weekend and everything was taken care of. You could let your mind go. And um, that's kind of how I've, you know, lived by, but he's a, he's a dis defensive specialist coach. I would say he really produces um, a lot of good defenders and center backs um, throughout the years. And, you know, I came in there as a midfielder um, mm -hmm. going into my freshman year and he converted me to a center back, but he told me that on my recruiting trip and he said, look, you're going to be a center back here. And you know, this is how you're going to make it professionally. And, um, you know, I really, I took to that. I, I fought it at first, but, you know, after I saw what he was doing with the, the guys around me and the guys before me, um, you know, it's pretty impressive, um, the pedigree of, of defending that he has there. And, um, you know, that's really where I learned how to, to play center back. And, you know, I credit that all to him. So this kind of segues into your time at DC United and a few questions about soccer. And as I was doing some research for this interview, uh, of course, your time with Kevin at Berkeley and your time with Ben Wilson kind of have some similarities in that they are essentially the only two coaches that you've played for yeah. um, professionally or as, as an adult. So I'm going to set up two extremes here. One, like I said, you've essentially played for two coaches for over a decade now between Kevin and Ben, and you've been with one professional team your entire career. And the other end of this um, scenario is that you've also had several caps for the men's national team appearing under a new coach almost every single time between Klinsman, Arena, and then I'm not sure if you played for Greg Brohalter, but no. I know there was like an interim coach at that point. Yeah. What was it like to leave uh, that consistent, the, leave the club environment where everything kind of feels very uh, consistent and calm and easy going to go into some sort of like chaotic sprint that the men's national team already is, but then to go in every time with it being such a different environment? Yeah, it's definitely tough. Um you know, you, you want to be there for your team the whole time. And they kind of, you know, this, the national team pulls you away, even when you're in league games. So you're missing league games. Yeah. Um, and that I think is the toughest part where, you know, you're kind of leaving your team um, high and dry at some point because you had to, you know, go away. I remember we went away for Copa America and I was gone from the, our team for almost a month. And that was tough, you know, you're away. And then you're into this setting where you're with a new coach, a new system um but the practices are really competitive obviously and everyone's you know working as hard as possible so you're in great form at that point and so when right. you come back to your team after that you're just buzzing and you're flying you have all the confidence in the world so um i think that's the the biggest positive is you go in with a lot of energy and you're working hard and you're um trying to prove yourself and um then you come back to your team and you have all this confidence and you can take what you learned there and bring it back and um be a leader and you know i think that was that was probably the coolest thing for me is the game kind of slowed down when I came back. My next question is now that you're a dad, is there anything happening in the locker room, especially with teenagers like Griffin and Moses that make you feel super old? <laughs> oh man, I don't know. I think uh, whenever they say um, lit or like <laughs> that, um, I just don't, I just don't understand it. Um, but I'm sure I have weird lingo for them, you know, um, from California, I say stoked and stuff like that. But uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I think it, it, the the funniest part is when we're in the locker room, we're talking about our baby's sleep schedules around with the guys and, you know, right. what's going on at home. And you can just kind of relate to the older guys now and the guys that have families where you're like, yeah, you know, I was up at whatever, 2 a.m. doing a bottle or or stuff like that. It's just funny now, the the different conversations you have with with people and you can relate to to guys on a, a different level which you know I didn't in the past I was like oh whatever I'm sleeping in I'm, I have no issues you know it's it is oh what it yeah is. like the Steve Birnbaum Chris Pontius days where yeah. like <laughs> yeah. no worries were had it's just like you and a buddy on the same team those, those were those were some fun times yeah we had a good time well, I mean, it, you're maturing very nicely, and it's it's kind of nice to see, uh, I imagine, as a player being with the same team for, for this long, nice to see the team grow. 
yeah. um, into what it is now, especially, I mean, demolition day when they broke ground for Audi Field was amazing. I was just thinking when you're talking about Kevin being super detail oriented and worrying about the grass, it's so funny to go from that to like RFK Yeah. Um, and to have such a good attitude about it. I mean, that has to be what has uh, kept you around for so long among many other things. But my question now is for, uh, I guess for the rest of the season, I know we have this weird six game um, sprint in about three weeks yeah. and they've changed the schedule for the transfer window to accommodate the pandemic. Um, I'm wondering, do you see the team changing much um, during the transfer window? You know, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I know there were talks about that. Um, you know, we already added or, you know, we lost Ema and we added Axel. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just to get some depth back there, um, which is good. So I, I don't know how much more there's going to be. That's kind of not my, my decision or, right. um, you know, it's above my pay grade, but uh, you know, I'm confident with the guys that we have. Um, we've been grinding uh, these last, you know, after the MLS's back tournament, you know, that was a bit of a disappointment for us. And, you know, we came back and we've been um, busting our butts for a while and, you know, ready for this game against Cincinnati. You know, it's just, it's nice to have a competitive game against another team. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing for us. And we've been working hard. It's weird because with the pandemic and everything that's going on, we've essentially had three preseasons and um, people don't really right. think about that. Yeah. Um, how much we've trained together and how much it, it, it takes a toll on you mentally because you're not having these games set up. Um, and so it's, it's a long time to be training. And when these games come now, guys are excited and uh, just ready to play and show what they can do. So I think that's, that's just kind of the, the weirdest thing is how much we've, not played any games. I think that's just the biggest thing that it's almost, you know, there's four months left in the year and we've only played a couple games. Right. Do you think third time's a charm then here? Do you guys feel good about the next six games? We do. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we need to really make a push right now. We're in, you know, there's, we don't know how many games there will be. We don't know uh, what the future holds. So we need to really push in these next six games to make sure we pick up as many points as we can and put ourselves in a good position for honestly, whatever happens, we're not sure what's going to happen. So um, right. if there's playoffs, if there's more games, you know, it is what it is, but we want to show what we got. And um, you know, it's no excuses this year because you know, we've been, we're ready to go. Do you think Portland and Orlando and the other guys that made it as far as they did, will be able to bounce back for this kind of last sprint or. Yeah. I mean, I think for them, the teams that went further than, us obviously we only played in the group stage I think for them that's like what you build on through confidence like you have a little bit more confidence maybe going into these games because you you won some games you have you know for Portland they won the cup and they did it in a, a great style so um you know in that sense I think that they're like oh we only have a you know a week or two week break where we're ready to go back into games and we're flying high so I don't think that's an issue for them I think for us it was just disappointing, but it was nice to get back to training so quickly that um, we could kind of put that in the rearview mirror and just focus on, you know, what's coming up. Okay, perfect. Did you see Portland and Orlando making it to the final? Did you watch much after you guys went home? I didn't watch as much as I wanted to. I think it was, I was so excited to get back with the family <laughs> yeah. and just, um, kind of be home that, you know, I kind of tapped out of the soccer world or watching tv for a lot of it because i watched so much while we were down there right um but yeah you know, i you know i watched the final i watched some of the you know lead up to it as well so um you know i, I don't know if i expected orlando to get there i think they're um, a much a much <laughs> different side this year though than they were last year right. i think he's done a great job with um kind of rebuilding them and um and them to play and you know portland's a hard team to to play any time of the year so uh, they did a good job. By the end of the tournament, having watched all those games, just watching, obviously did not play, but I was exhausted. Yeah. Um, so the last question I'll ask before I get into some a few other things. Uh, I know that there was a lot of conversation about the mark that Wayne Rooney left while he was in D.C. Um, what kind of like culture or what example as a leader did he set and – that you take with you now into this season that has kind of changed how you approach a leadership role? Yeah. I mean, it's hard, it's, it's hard to emulate what he did. Right. I mean, he's, he's such a big presence and guys look up to him and he's a legend. Right. So um, he would walk into a room and, you know, everyone would be 
I don't want to say on their best behavior, but they wanted to please him in a lot of ways yeah. and make sure that, you know, they performed on the field. So I think it's a little bit different for me. Um, you know, I obviously don't have his resume and, you know, the, you know, the pedigree that he has. So uh, for me, I've always, and I will continue to, you know, lead by example and do things in practice that I won't ask people to do something that I'm not willing to do. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm always working hard and, uh, I think it's, he did show me of when it's good times to get into guys or when it's, you know, you put a, put your arm around them and, you know, kind of have a talking with them. So, um, that's kind of the best thing that he showed me, I think. I like that. Um, and your time in DC, had you ever been here before you had been drafted in 2014? Crazy enough. Um, my first college soccer game was in Georgetown. So oh, okay. freshman, uh, we've stayed on the Roslyn side of the Marriott right on the water um, and played against Georgetown in my first game. So that was, uh, that was crazy. And then we played in Maryland uh, the, the next uh, two days later. Nice. But it was so weird to be like um, drafted back here and be like, oh my God, that's where we stayed, you know, right. over five years ago. So it's kind of, it was a little bit surreal coming back and I guess it's calling it home now. Nice. Um, do you still live in the district? Uh, yes, we live in AU Park right now up by uh, American University. When like newcomers uh, sign with the team or are looking for places to live, do you ever try to sell them on the benefits of being in the district versus across the Potomac? All, all the time. I try and tell people, uh, especially younger guys, if they have an opportunity to live in DC, I highly recommend it. Um, I think it's um, it's a beautiful city, um, one of the most powerful cities in the world. Um, it's kind of unique in its own way and uh you know now that Audi Field's down at the wharf you know what a better you know why would you not live in DC I get it's uh, a little bit pricey but um I think the the benefits you know outweigh the cons and you know unfortunately we're having a bunch of guys now move out to Loudoun area so yeah um I when I first moved here I remember trying to tell my parents when I know I'm only making 30 grand a year but the commute is so important to me. I did not want to schlep in. I know your guys, your guys' schedule is a little bit different, but um, yeah, I can't imagine wanting to live way out in Virginia unless I had a family, which leads me to my next question is, are you and Jean kind of talking about maybe taking the, the family out farther? I don't think so. I think we're going to stay around this area. Oh, we really like this area, um, you know, maybe here at Bethesda, um, but it's close enough to the city where we can pop in for date night and not have to really worry about it or, you know, we can go down to the monuments and all that stuff. And it's not too far for me to commute to Audi. Um, so we, we love DC and my wife loves being in the, in the district. So I'm not sure how far she'll, um, you know, want us to move out. Right. Yeah. No, I completely agree. She's in the fashion industry. She's creative. She wants to be around, you know, around all the hustle and bustle, but I also, I get the sense that she might be cooler than you. Am I, am She's I wrong? <laughs> much cooler than me. She is way cooler than me. Um, yeah, I'm very lucky. Well, I felt uh, I felt like that Tucker Nuck um, kind of photo shoot that you and Bill <laughs> and John Franklin did a couple years ago. At first, I felt like it came out of nowhere. And then when I realized that's where she worked, I'm like, bless her for dressing you guys so well. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's great. She's so uh, she's a great eye. Now she works for uh, big time leather company up in Annapolis. And so mm -hmm. um, she gets to kind of do her thing with that. And um, no, it's just, it's, uh, my life is definitely different. I would, I'm a very, um, I would say minimalist. Um, I have a very minimalist personality and I don't need a lot or, uh, but she definitely brings out the creative side in, in our family. And that's yeah. why our house looks fairly good. <laughs> good. Just a little flair. That's what you need. Exactly. Um, okay, so I turned 30 in January, and so do you. And you and Jean both had a kick-ass safari as your honeymoon. We did. I was, I honestly, I think that that's the best way to do it. If you've got the energy for the wedding and the honeymoon, you, like, you might as well go balls to the yeah. wall. Um, I know you'll have a newborn, another one in January, but are you planning anything big for your 30th? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um, I was before I found out my wife was pregnant. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not sure all my buddies, we wanted to link up back in Southern California or something in the off season. Um, but I'm not sure. We, we did that kind of that safari honeymoon blowout down in South Africa. 
um, knowing that we were trying to have kids uh, soon after they were like, let's go to the furthest place away and do something that we just won't be able to do for a very long time. And um, what an experience that was. I mean, that was, you know, mind blowing. And uh, it was, it changed us, I think, um, how cool it was. So that was probably the biggest thing we'll do. I think now, you know, if you would have asked me, <laughs> If you would have asked me, you know, five, six years ago, if you thought I was going to have two kids before 30, I, I would have laughed. And, uh, but that's how life is. And yeah, I think, yeah. I think uh, just having a nice dinner with some friends and stuff like that and people over would probably be uh, a good birthday. Maybe my wife will let me sleep in. That's about it. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. That would be very yeah. nice. I'll probably be sleeping in. I definitely, I am hoping the pandemic doesn't continue, but I just want to go to a beach. There you go. Uh, that's all I want. So that's, that's I, I would love that. I would love that too. So I want to finish this up with a few would you rather questions. Okay. Um, I did talk about how we both had golf in common. I told Sam when the pandemic is over that I would rather do that in person. Like yeah. go hit some balls or maybe see if like Julian Gressel really is as good as y'all say he is. Okay. Um, <laughs> He's very good. <laughs> I just, man, what a what an activity um, that really can humble uh, yes. people who are otherwise good at, at different sports. Um, I didn't know you played golf. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I, I, that's my favorite thing to do. If we have an off day, go out there, play 18, be outside and um, just relax and be around friends. Um, does get competitive, but I mean, that's what I like to do. I think it's awesome. So that's right. it's really cool to play golf. I want to say there are three or four of them here. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. You retire from Major League Soccer. We won't say when, we won't say how. Are you more likely to, one, invest or own in a USL team, two, coach a USL team, or three, play for a USL team? Invest or own. Okay, good choice. Yeah. Um, especially given half of these uh, teams that are coming up in, in Major League Soccer are coming from the USL anyway, so yeah. you get out of the curve. There we go. Okay, next question. Would you rather play golf with Gareth Bale, Harry Kane, or Pep Guardiola? Pep. They all have single-digit handicaps, by the way. I know. They're, I've heard they're all unbelievable. But Pep, um, I love his enthusiasm. I love watching him. Um, I watched the uh, um, All or Nothing on Man City on Amazon Prime, oh, yeah. and it made me fall in love with him as a coach, um, the way he interacts with his players. So I'd love to just pick his brain and and listen to him, I feel like that would be um, an awesome experience. Perfect. Okay, good choice. All right, next question. For the remainder of your career, would you rather play all your games at 9 a.m. or all your games at 10 p.m.? Um, for the remainder of my career, uh, I would say 9 a.m. Uh, as weird as that sounds, um, I I prefer to wake up and play. Um, I think sitting right. around all day dwelling in a game is, is tough. But uh, as long as you play on the weekends and people are able to come, I think 9 a.m. wouldn't be too bad. And, so you don't want a 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning game where everyone, like, forgot? <laughs> exactly. But I would prefer, you know, to have the rest of the day to, you know, celebrate the win or be with family. Right. And, you know, you go to a nice uh, early dinner or lunch after the game and, and uh yeah, just kind of reflect on the game. And um, I think that'd be cool. I'm sure a bunch of people would disagree with me on that. I don't know. That feels very uh, like AYSO. I kind of like it. It does. It brings me back to, you know, my coast soccer league days. And even in college, we didn't have lights at, at Cal. So we played a lot of our games at one or three oh. in the afternoon. Okay. I don't know. I'm Yeah, I'm into that, especially because it's not unlike 9am where you'd have to wake up super early. If you played it kind of at noon I feel like yeah. you at least have a little bit more of your morning left yeah exactly okay man so <clears throat> the follow-up to that is for the remainder of your career would you rather play all away games at whatever time you choose or all home games at 10 p.m uh all home games you just have to to get get yeah. through it I love to play in front of our fans. I think, um, especially now that we have Audi Field, it's a, it feels like home. Um, RFK was amazing, don't get me wrong. I loved um, being there. It was very historic, and um, it was great to experience. Um, but I love that we have a soccer-specific stadium in the district, um, and we get kind of the – or at least we did in the beginning as it 
you know, turned on the casual fan that would maybe go to like Nats games or stuff. And they would just come and be like, oh, let's see what this is all about. And then they'd be hooked. And I feel like we'd get those casual fans coming back. So um, we, I love playing at Audi Field. I love being in front of our fans. Um, and obviously, I want my family to come to all the games. Nice. Well, those are the only questions I have. Cool. Uh, but Steve, thank you so much for joining me. I really of course. Thanks for having me. And, and great job. This was uh, very smooth for your first time. I, I'm very impressed. <laughs> I like to talk about myself, which I think I did probably a third of this video, so. Yeah, it's good that um, you can relate to it though. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Peace, love, and soccer. <laughs>